Welcome. Welcome everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, this is the New England Farm Link Collaborative, Make Your Land Available for Farming. And this webinar is made possible as part of the Land for Farmers project, which is funded by the Beginning Farmer and Rancher Development Program grant from the USDA National Institute of Food and Agriculture. So I mentioned when you came in that we are the New England FarmLink Collaborative, which is made up of a few different organizations around New England, Connecticut FarmLink, Maine FarmLink, Vermont FarmLink, and then um, the New England Farmland Finder, which is administered by Land for Good. And so we have representatives from each of those organizations here today. My name is Rachel Bryce. I'm the program coordinator with Land for Good, and I'll be your host for today. Um, I'm calling in from what is now Walpole, New Hampshire, on the traditional and current homelands of the Abenaki people. Um, at Land for Good, we believe that land is sacred to all of us and something to be honored and treasured, not exploited. We have a real awareness of the lived history of indigenous peoples and nations in a long era, a long continuing era of colonialism. And so I'm taking this moment to honor and acknowledge those who have stewarded the land before us and continue to do so. If this map is something that interests you, um, I encourage you to visit Native Land Digital, which is an online map that wipes away the borders imposed by colonial powers to reveal a complex and colorful overlap of indigenous territories, languages, and treaties. Um, you can check out this website at native-land.ca and I'll put that um, URL into the chat if you wanna check it out. Um, I think it's pretty cool. Today, um, we're going to be covering a number of topics relevant to helping you make decisions on making your land available to a farmer, um, including some of the benefits, what to expect, and how to communicate with folks who might be interested in farming on your land. We'll go over some property evaluation tools, and of course, we'll leave plenty of time for questions and answers. Um, so with that, I'll turn it over to our first presenter. Thank you, Rachel. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Sue Lamper. I am the coordinator for the Maine Farm Link Program. I work for Maine Farmland Trust. So my, my program is exclusively um, in Maine. And I am here today. Where am I? Verona Island. So I'm on the coast of Maine, mid coast of Maine. Um, I'm going to be talking a little bit about the benefits of making your land available. So uh, as you see on the first slide, there are, yes, there are thousands of people who are looking for land. Are they all serious? Mm, maybe not. Are there some pretty serious out there? Yeah. <clears throat> so it's pretty hard to judge um, how many seekers have joined up and are looking in the matching programs. Um, some of our programs do not require them to fill out an application form in order to see the information about the land owners. Um, my program does not. So it's hard for me to judge how many people are actually out there looking, um, but there are a lot. One example uh, here in Maine alone, we had one farm that was that located in a densely populated area here in central Maine. It, uh, the landowners fill out the application form. I put all of the information online on a Friday afternoon. Uh, this is, so it would be our website the New England Farmland Finder website, as well as our fa main, face main farm link Facebook page. By Monday morning, the landowners were calling and saying, please take our information down. We have been overwhelmed by the response. We need to sift through all of the people who have contacted us. And uh, so in doing so, I had discovered that there were over 24,000 views on our Facebook page alone. So that just tells me Yes, there are people out there looking, and yes, we need good quality farmland for these people who are interested in bringing land either back into agriculture or keeping it in agriculture. Um, so with that, there are hundreds of postings on all of the different sites all throughout New England. 
um, speaking for my program here in Maine, um, we've been talking a lot at Maine Farmland Trust about cluster farms or larger farms that are more spread out. Um, you know, there's two different sides, whether it makes sense to have some smaller properties that are all together or having some bigger thriving farms that are more spread out across the state. So having a, a larger property located near you, perhaps they need some extra pasture land or some hay land or crop land. So if you feel like your property might be small in comparison to some of these larger farms, even though it might be small, it's still going to be beneficial. You know, they might need just some, some smaller acreage for, you know, the things that I mentioned before. Um, some benefits to the cluster farming could be, you know, when you have a bunch of smaller farms in a smaller radius, say 20 mile radius, um, you got to think about things like transportation, going to markets, venues, and going to distribution centers. Um, there's a draw for having a, a customer base. And if they're selling on roadside stands and CSA pickups, if you have all of these different cluster farms right close nearby, you're drawing in your customers and everyone is, is benefiting from that. Another example could be uh, multiple dairy farms in a, you know, a, a decent acreage or a decent uh, mileage perimeter. Um, milk companies are gonna be more apt to give a contract or sign a contract when they know that the, the milk trucks are not gonna have to drive hundreds of miles out of the way for just one, one property that's gonna be out not so near the others. So having, you know, properties that are closer together, that just gives a, you know, more benefit. Another thing to think about is equipment sharing. If you've got um, farmers who are living close by to each other, you know, Farmer John has, you know, X, Y, and Z tools, and Farmer Jane knows this and will call to borrow them. It's just a good way to build strength in the farming network, in the farming community. It's pretty much a win-win. Uh, next slide, Rachel, please. Uh, so I feel like it makes sense, you know, making your land available for the next generation of farmers. Uh, there's a large and growing number of interested young farmers and they're looking for agricultural land. Uh, perhaps they're, they were not raised in a farming family, but that does not mean they don't have the interest and goals for utilizing agricultural land. So making your land available gives them the opportunities to, to thrive for the next generation. So I feel like keeping your land available in agriculture kind of speaks for itself. I mean, if you have land that is good and has good value in agricultural terms, meaning the acreage, the soils, the location, just knowing that you're keeping the land active and using the land for the best ag purposes is gonna keep the land available again for the next generation. Um, it's also going to keep it going for the farmers that need it for their food, their commodities, and all of those things. Uh, revenue, perhaps you need to supplement your income with some extra cushion. Making your land available, it can give you the cushion that you're looking for. Charging a fair lease price, you know, to a neighboring farmer to help cover the cost of the things that you may have, like taxes, perhaps improvements on your property that you need to make. Maybe it's your retirement goals. It's just a good way to boost your income. So when you advertise through programs such as ours, it gives your agricultural land the opportunity to be seen by people who are looking for agricultural land, again, and they're agricultural focused, and they're looking for good quality land versus, you know, perhaps a large piece of property with a big home on the open real estate market. Nothing wrong with this this typical way that people, you know, advertise a sale. Um, but when you advertise with programs like ours, you just, you know, you're looking at the audience and the audience is looking for properties, hopefully like what you have to offer. So I'll just touch briefly on these uh, couple of points that are on this slide. So lease rates, as I spoke about a moment ago, that's where you could supplement your income. Every property is gonna have a different outcome for lease rates. It's going to determine by what you have to offer. Do you have a large open acreage for crops? Do you have a smaller parcel with maybe a small home and a barn or shed to offer? Do you have water, electricity? All of those things factor in when it comes down to leases. 
and the cost to run the property. Um, taxes. Every state and town, they have a different tax program and formula. So you just need to make sure that your property has, the assessor has taxed it properly for what you have to offer there. Um, and again, your lease your lease payments, they can offset the rising cost of your tax burdens. It's just one, one great way to, to look at it. Um, so property management, setting a plan and having somebody to execute the plan for keeping your farmland active in agriculture, it will help with things like management of weeds and in invasive species, improving the soil health. Perhaps your land has been laying fallow for a while and you're really looking to get the soils back into you know, a good hardy agricultural use. Uh, keeping the property from becoming overgrown and not being able to be used in the future. The longer it sits fallow and unused, the longer it will take to bring it back into good active production. Uh, so, and some goals that you might have is to just know what your goals are for your overall self or the land. Um, is it to make your land available for the things that I've mentioned previously? Is it the legacy of the property? Do you want to make sure that your family or your townspeople or whoever has the opportunity to continue to see this property thrive? Perhaps it's been in, you know, the family or the town for decades or even centuries, and you just really want to make sure that this property continues to be used the way that, you know, it's been used in the past years going on to the future. So do you want to keep your uh, agriculture local? Do you want to keep good local foods and local revenue? Um, and so do you want to, and setting some goals for your property is a great, great place to start. Um, so that's pretty much what I have. And I have up next is Nikki. And Nikki is going to talk a little bit about communications. Thanks, Sue. Um, yeah, I'm Nikki Leonard. I work as a farm business specialist or planner with the Interville Center in Vermont. Uh, and we also manage the Vermont um, Landlink website. Um, so like Sue said, I'm going to go over kind of the expectations and communication um, kind of between you and the farmer and right like ultimately just trying to build a trusting relationship with each other. Um, you're going to hear this often through the next few slides, but right like as with any relationship, um, you know, a strong landowner farmer relationship, you know, is also necessary to, to build on, you know, those shared values and good communication. Um, as Sue just went over, you, you know, you as a landowner, you have goals for your for your land, uh, the aesthetics. Uh, maybe you have a, a goal of certain kinds of farming practices that you envision. Um, you know how someone would ex, you know access your property, uh, and maybe just kind of this idea or goal or um, expectations of your involvement or your level involvement in this farm's business. Um, as you can imagine, those goals and expectations of yours might not fit uh, with the farmer's needs um, in their expectations. Um, you know, you might be envisioning this pastoral scene, you know, of, of grazing cattle on a hillside part of your property. Um, however, if, you know, that part of the, the, the land has poor, you know, um, access for, for tractors or vehicles, or maybe no water source, um, maybe you, are you know requesting certain restrictions and what kind of fencing maybe that can be used? Um, you know this whole picturesque vision uh, probably won't be achieved. Um, so just a note, you know, knowing that each farmer brings their own vision and goals um, and objectives to their business, um, remembering that farms are businesses, right, um, and that land is essential part of these farm businesses. Um, if you, you know, spreading manure, maybe like on a Saturday afternoon might be seemingly unpleasant to you. Um, you know, that to some farmers, that's one of the most efficient means of improving soil fertility, for example. Um, so I guess at a baseline, um, both you and the farmer kind of must recognize each other's, you know, these possibly conflicting values um, and how best to, to come to an agreement on that. Um, I guess, yeah, to touch on leasing to a new farmer versus maybe a more experienced farmer, um, that beginning farmer may depend completely on accessing leased farmland, 
Um, so sometimes a year long lease is adequate. Uh, that would give the farmer and you um, kind of this opportunity to try a new arrangement. Annual leases have their drawbacks, as you can imagine, when talking about you know, land security, uh, but it does allow the, the new farmer to, to maybe learn how to run their farm business. Um, it also frees up probably the limited capital they have in these early years to then buy equipment, let's say, and not have to worry about a down payment and a mortgage. Um, the more experienced farmer looking to lease land probably will have more longer term goals for their business. Um, and then enhance kind of that need for a longer term lease. Uh, they're probably looking more to make then the longer term investments in this land uh, through soil and infrastructure improvements. Um, again, just to better their established farm businesses. Um, next slide, Rachel. Um, yeah, the role of you. <laughs> it's gonna be a, spe a spectrum, right? On one side, you know, of your involvement uh, is that you maybe co-own this farm business. Um, at the other end, you know, it just looks at you as a landlord receiving payments and maybe you just never visit the property. Um, those are two very extreme sides of the spectrum and, you know, most likely you're gonna fall somewhere in the middle. Um, but regarding kind of um, your involvement in the business, I guess, unless there's a formal agreement between the both of you that gives you a role, that spells out a role of yours in the business, um, you can expect you are not to be involved in kind of the operational or management uh, decisions of the business. Um, you may give advice if it is solicited, uh, but you can imagine the farmer may not be interested in what you have to say um, about how the farm is being run. Um, I mean, this may be difficult for some landowners just out of your intentions are goodwilled. Um, but if we're looking at this through the perspective of you as the landlord, you know, you may just want to make sure that the farmer meets your expectations kind of spelled out in this agreement, meaning the farmer can pay the rent if it's a lease agreement. Um, and kind of everything else is for the farmer to wor worry about. Um, I guess landowners often fear what happens when there are problems. Um, you know, if a farmer, you know, is not the right fit and this relationship just isn't working out. Um, and again, here's where I'll insert, as with any relationship, there will be disagreements. Um, and kind of this good communication, you know, it will be possible to, to survive these, these rocky patches. Um, I will kind of insert, you know, thinking about this idea of mediation, uh, farmers generally have access to farm mediation programs and services in their states, and these services are usually free of cost. Um, so what this means, somebody that has experience, you know, with these farmer tenant relationships, they can come in and facilitate these difficult conversations if need be. Um, another way of kind of looking at uh, resolving these issues Kind of ultimately, if it's not working, um, a good lease will be clear about how to terminate this relationship. Um, so it's probably a good idea for leases to be designed so that both of you can grow into them. Uh, meaning, you know, if a lease can start out on an annual basis uh, for the first one to three years, let's say, and then maybe can convert or roll into a five to 10 year term. Uh, next slide. Um, communication. And again, you'll be hearing, as with any relationship, I kind of want this like to be the, the walk away, um, you know, uh, but it is true. Um, you're trying to build that trusting relationship um, and communication is a part of that. Um, it's definitely necessary when, you know, whether you're present on the land um, being leased or you own the land, lease it, and you live in another state. Um, so like, here's the point in the, in the negotiations or conversations uh, when building a lease um, that you and the farmer spell out kind of each other's goals and needs. And again, kind of this roadmap of how to communicate and how to resolve the issues when they come up, because um, as we can anticipate, it's not an if, but a, a when these issues happen. Um, next slide. The issues. Um, this is certainly not an exhaustive list, right? Um, but some of the issues that we kind of see over and over, and especially just 
cons you know, considerations to, to think through when negotiating the lease. Um, right away, you can probably see that it's a good idea to get all of this covered uh, in writing. Um, even if it is for that one year term, there's just so much to, uh, to consider. Um, something else to consider that's not shown on the slide uh, is involving a, an attorney uh, to review or draft this lease. Um, and we hear that it's, you know, legal fees are really expensive. Um, but just kind of think of it this way, that investing in those legal fees now may save you future legal fees that are X-fold um, if there are disputes that come up that are beyond your, your own you know, abilities to resolve them together. Um, a comment on kind of an, building in an end date uh, into the lease. It is important because it provides you know, an opportunity for, for you and the farmer to have a chance to sit down kind of review the agreement at the end of the term, what went well, uh, what didn't, and then be able to make those adjustments um, and changes into a new lease, if that's of interest. Uh, next slide. Um, so this is the last slide of for my part, but um, this last slide kind of outlines, again, the kind of, so you might have these common issues that we keep seeing as service providers, but this is kind of a common way that we've seen how to divide those common issues. Um, again, this is one way to kind of see it. Uh, your situation might look differently in, in, in the needs of how to split it all up. Um, a sticky point that we see kind of over and over again um, is addressing these new permanent improvements um, like constructing buildings or bringing in greenhouses, drilling wells. Um, and again, just like there's a spectrum of your involvement, there can be the spectrum of, of how to handle pain for these, these capital costs. Um, so on one end, you know, the spectrum, um, you can pay for the improvements yourself, all of it as part of the lease, you know, with this understanding that maybe their rent may increase uh, in the future. Um, Another option is for you and the farmer to share these costs. Uh, maybe the farmer provides the labor to build the greenhouse and maybe you pay for the materials. Um, and then kind of on the other end, uh, the farmer pays for all of these agreed, like these agreed kind of permanent infrastructural projects. Usually it's built in that you would both agree to what's gonna be happening. Um, but if the farmer pays for all of it up front, there usually is a provision that, you know, the farmer will get reimbursed should the lease end before um, the lifetime or the useful life of that improvement is over. Um, so to kind of like break that down a little bit, let's say that if the farmer pays for this greenhouse, you know, this year, and for some reason the lease is terminated next year, uh, the farmer should be re reimbursed for the value of the greenhouse at the greenhouse's life year two. Um, you just kind of have to think about it because otherwise you would get this kind of unfair advantage financially of not having to have paid for the greenhouse up front. And you're also benefiting from getting the increased um, value or appraised value of your property because of this additional um, asset. Um, so I guess ultimately, you know, right, like all of these issues, it should all be discussed before you enter into an agreement uh, with the farmer. Um, and just to kind of sum it all up, kind of this willingness by both of you to be flexible and open to each other's point of views and expectations and needs uh, will create that strong foundation uh, for communication and, and problem solving um, in the future and down the road. Um, so I guess, uh, with that, I'll pass it on to, to Jay and Will. Great, thanks. Um, yeah, so my name is Jay Silverman. I'm the Massachusetts field agent with Land for Good. Uh, and one of the hats that I wear is also being the site administrator for New England Farmland Finder. Um, so it's been been fun to take this work. And I, I'm a first generation hay farmer in Conway, Mass, so the western part of the state. Um, but it's, it's great to have this opportunity to connect with people across the region. Um, so yeah, I just want to you know echo everything that's been said so far, and and as a landowner, the importance of doing this work of thinking about motivations, thinking about um, you know different protocols and communication pieces and stuff to have in mind, and then when you're feeling like you're you're ready to start considering um, either posting a property or start 
having word of mouth or seeing about finding a farmer um, for your land, you just try to do some work to make sure that you can, you know, really have a clear sense of what it is you're offering uh, before even necessarily posting that ad or starting to put the word out um, and making sure that farmers have a, have a good sense of what it is you're up for. And that can include a, you know, a lot of flexibility on your part, but I think in this work and trying to help people negotiate arrangements, it can be difficult if uh, there's such an open-ended idea that both parties have a hard time figuring out how to proceed. Um, so before, uh, you know, before really starting this trail of, of advertising or, or seeing who's available, um, I'm trying to encourage folks to work through a few different pieces of what you actually have available to offer. Um, and that can totally depend on your experience with the land. If, if you've ever farmed it yourself or if it's family land, you might know a bit more. Um, if it's land that you've come into a bit more recently or maybe hasn't been farmed in quite a while, uh, there's some pieces you can help figure out and help communicate to a farmer about what's possible. Um, talk a little bit about acreage and soils in a, in a bit. Those can be two big factors of, as far as how much land you actually have to make available, as well as what's the land conducive for with the soils. But also big questions that come up from farm seekers are the idea of infrastructure and housing. So um, those being two separate pieces, but both in, uh, involve structures on the property and what the farmer's needs might be for their business. And also a great number of farmers are looking for housing to be either on or very near the land that they are looking for. So trying to think through, are, are any of those things you have to offer the arrangement or not? And that can just simply affect who might be interested and, and what kind of farmers might reach out. Um, rent has been touched on and we'll talk about that a bit more next week too when we get into a bit more about leasing. Um, but just having some ideas in mind of what, what it is you're looking for, comp looking for, for compensation. Um, and being able to know where you where you draw the line or what you're hoping for, rather than ending up in a really open ended um, conversation with a farm a farmer and not really knowing how to proceed there. Um, and then, as Nikki was talking about too, thinking about what your property is going to end up looking like with a farmer on it, and spending some time thinking through what types of farming you're truly open for. Um, are livestock actually a possibility on your land, and is that something that you'd be open to? Are there um, or are there different types of livestock that you're open to, but maybe not others? Um, some landowners feel pretty strongly about things like organic practices or even no-till practices. And those are all things that are fine, uh, you know, as a landowner to, to request or have a preference for on your land and could even be built into the lease. But it, you know, it all can either broaden or narrow the funnel of potential farm seekers that might be interested in your property. So knowing some of that stuff up front and maybe having some flexibility to discuss and, and be open to different ideas is great. Um, but just trying to make sure you have that thought through. And then especially if there's multiple people involved, um, other family members or, or people that have a, a vested interested party in the land, making sure that that you are all in agreement of which of these things you're up for, um, you know, ideally before trying to make the make the um, opportunity available, because as, as Sue said, sometimes a really great property can pop up on one of these farm linking sites and then interested farm seekers are all over it. And, uh, you know, you just want to be prepared to actually get those inquiries and be able to answer some of these questions. Um, so that's things that all of us here are happy to help you work through, um, but just food for thought as you're working through this process. Uh, next slide, please. So when we're doing this work and, and working with farmers on the other end of this that are trying to find farmland, um, one tool that I rely on a lot is this necessary, desirable, optional exercise. And this is really helping a farmer think through their end of that exact same criteria set. Um, what it is that they're truly looking for, where they draw the line on what they're not willing to consider, or maybe where they have some flexibility. And so just offering this as a way to think through it yourselves and put yourselves in the, the shoes of farm seekers and, and what their needs might be. Um, and also there's ways to build out this exercise as far as what you have and what you're looking for and what kind of farmer arrangement uh, might be ideal for you. Um, next slide, please. So here's an example of, of one farm seeker I worked with that you know they really spent some time thinking about it and whittled down that unicorn property they were looking for into some different criteria about you know the necessary column where these pieces that were essentially deal breakers if they couldn't get at least uh, at least five acres in this case, or um, certain rental amounts, uh, they needed electricity and water, different things that they essentially wouldn't even consider a property if it didn't have these things for their operation and their business. Um, every farm seeker is different and depends how much of the overall operation your property might be. Um, so yeah, so anyway, just offering this as something to think through and, and really kind of putting yourself in the shoes of a farm seeker as they're, they're uh, considering this process. And, and there might be some considerations that they're excited about that your property has that might be in, you know, the optional column of this, where it's something that wouldn't make or break it. Um, but it could be a, a benefit that you have, whether that's things like, um, you know, plumbed water out to fields or, or different things that can sweeten the deal for them. 
Um, so I encourage folks to kind of go through this exercise, either mentally or even starting to write down what your criteria might be on your property. Um, next slide, please. So looking at those attributes themselves, um, like I said, two of the biggest things that we work with folks on is figuring out the acreage and the soils for their property. Um, so I wanted to share some information about that as well as some tools to help empower you as a, a landowner to learn a bit more about what that is and ways to calculate it. Um, so in the, in the big picture, acreage and soils are kind of two things that are relatively unchanging about a piece of property. Um, you know, I, I think it depends how big your property is and what percentage of that you're hoping to make available. There are some times that you have a bigger farm um, and are only looking to make a small piece available to a farmer, or maybe you're flexible on that. So it's it could be a property that the farmer could grow into over time, start out leasing a small piece of acreage and gradually increase. Um, but, you know, in, in general, the you you know the overall acreage of your property, but you might not know exactly how many acres the backfield is or whatever chunk you're looking to make available. Um, and then likewise with soils, it's generally an unchanging attribute of your property as far as soil type um, and what kind of farming can happen there. And I'll show a tool for looking at that. And it's important to distinguish that from things like fertility, which, uh, you know, that can be a value that's changed. Soil can be amended, fertilizer can be added, or lime ways to uh, improve the nutrient quality. But the overall soil type, as far as sandiness, rockiness, how well drained it is, generally doesn't change over time. And these are things that farmers are, are looking at really clearly. Um, so making sure you have a good understanding of what your property has, what its limitations might be, um, and, and helping to communicate that to a farmer can be really important. Uh, next slide, please. So one of those tools that we use is uh, the Google My Maps tool. And that's different than just Google Maps. It's this, this extra um, tool as part of the Google suite that's at mymaps.google.com. Um, if you search Google My Maps, it'll, it'll come up. And it's basically this awesome data layer that allows you to do all kinds of things over a Google map. Um, and so in this case, it allows you to measure distances, you can measure area, you can color code, um, and people even use this tool to make complex uh, lease maps or field rotation maps. The great thing about it being on the Google suite is you can actually share it with other folks. Um, a lot of times a, either a tenant or a landowner will work on a lease map and then share it with the other party and say, how does this look and make edits and be able to work on the same document. Um, but in, in regard to figuring out what your land has available for a farmer, this helps you ground truth what um, particular field has available, especially in New England, where there's a lot of mixed mixture between trees and open ground, uh, partially open ground. You might know the exact um, surveyed acreage of your property as a whole, but that back 10 acre field that you have available, um, maybe that's what your parents or grandparents or the previous owner called it. Maybe it was always just called the 10 acre field. But in reality, maybe that tree line's moved in 30 feet from where the stone wall used to be um, due to folks brush hogging the field every year, ducking under new branches. And um, a farmer might come in and realize that maybe it's only eight acres or some amount that's that's less than what they were hoping for. Um, so this tool can really allow you to get that top-down view and clearly delineate how much acreage um, a certain field has. And that's something we work with farm seekers to make sure they feel empowered to do that too. Um, but you know, in the long run, it, it the arrangement has a much better chance of working if both parties um, clearly understand what's there and understand both the the opportunities and the limitations of the land. Um, so these are things that we're happy to help work work with on folks also. Um, and actually, if you go to the next slide, please, I have a uh, just a quick screenshot. Oh boy, that resolution doesn't come through well. You're not meant to read this. Just to know the resource exists that we have a map uh, walkthrough on how to use this tool um, on the Land for Good website. And it walks you through step-by-step step of how to draw, draw shapes, measure um, different amounts, and be able to know what your property has and ways to save it and share it with other people. Um, so if you have any trouble finding that, uh, feel free to reach out, but just want to make you feel empowered to use that. Uh, next slide, please. Great. So the next piece, um, so acreage is all about how much land you actually have. And looking at soils is all about what's going on underfoot, um, what the property itself is well suited for, and what types of, what types of agriculture. So um, this is a tool that's really helpful for farm seekers when they're here of a property and they want to learn about it. Um, but you as a property owner, it can help you figure out what some of those limitations are, especially if the property hasn't been used for agriculture um, in quite some time, or if maybe it was used for one particular type and you're trying to figure out what else it might be suited for. Um, so what this uses, you know, the, the soil survey that the, was basically done in the 70s and 80s, the USDA took soil cores all across the US and mapped out what the soil types look like. 
um, it's it's an estimation and approximation, but it's it ends up being pretty close. And so this data is available online in a few different tools. Um, one of them is the web soil survey that a lot of folks know. Um, but the other one is this UC Davis soil web tool that we direct a lot of folks to. And one advantage of this tool is it allows you to pull up a property and start clicking around and learning about it really quickly. Um, so when you look at this map, you have different areas outlined by these uh, yellow lines. So every every blob essentially in this map um, is roughly the same soil type. And um, when you click around on this map, on this particular one, that little red X in the middle is, is where I clicked for the screenshot. And then it tells you a whole bunch of information on the left. You can get easily overwhelmed. It's a rabbit hole you can go down. Um, but there's a couple of key things to look at and things that you can help communicate to a, a farm seeker about not only what you have, but um, maybe how how realistic the map is or which direction the land slope slopes. Um, and if you haven't plowed up the ground or really know what's going on under, underfoot, it can help you figure out things like rockiness, um, how well drained the soil is, and even for things like rental rates, figure out if the farmland is prime or if it's of state, statewide importance or has other limitations to it. Um, so I, I've, I've worked with landowners before that have an open field and feel really altruistic and really eager to have a farmer on that land and envision vegetables and it would be really open for um you know a vegetable csa or some other perhaps more tillage intensive um traditionally tillage intensive farming practice on that land um and start communicating that to farm seekers and and everybody gets excited about the vision but not necessarily understand the limitations the soil might have and maybe it's very poorly drained there maybe there's a lot more rocks than you can actually tell without plowing up the soil or, or other things that are going to drastically affect um, what a farmer could do on that land. Um, so it's really important to make sure you have that understanding. And, and if again, if you have history with that land, whether you farmed it or your family farmed it, um, I still encourage you to pull this up and see how that compares to your knowledge. And if there's something off base, communicating that to a farm seeker as well and helping them explain, oh, the soil map is showing this, but in, in reality, here's been my experience. Any of that that they can glean from you is great. And you know, assuming best intentions on both parties is wonderful. Um, in my experience, neither party is looking to mislead the other about what's available there, but making sure the due diligence and what's actually understood is is quite important. Um, next slide, please. So similarly, we have another um, walkthrough on how to use specifically the UC Davis tool. As I mentioned, there's web soil survey, there's other, other ways to pull up that exact same data. Um, but in our experience, uh, the UC Davis tool allows people to access it the most quickly. And again, you just plug in an address and start clicking around and learning about it um, almost immediately. So this is also on the Land for Good website. Um, but again, if you have any questions about it, feel free to reach out and uh, happy to point you in the right direction or um, you know, even working with landowners to help uh, decipher some of this information or answer questions about different types of farming or what, what needs there might be. Um, great, next slide, please. Uh, yeah. So, um, so looking at a farm seeker search criteria, you know, they're going to be looking at these different aspects and trying to figure out what actually meets their needs. Um, and again, soils and acreage are, are big pieces of that. But uh, there's also lots of other attributes about the farm, about your location, the infrastructure, the um, different things that you might have available for a farmer, including their layout that could really influence their, uh, their decision. Um, I believe the next slide's handing it off to Will to talk a little bit more about infrastructure and farm layout. That's correct. Thanks so much, Jay. My name is Will Amira. I'm the Connecticut field agent with Land for Good. Uh, I, as part of my role, I help to administer the Connecticut FarmLink website, uh, and I'm also a vegetable farmer in uh, Morris, Connecticut, in the northwest corner of our state. Um, and to kind of expand on what Jay was talking about, we're going to look a little bit at um, other location attributes that um, that your farm might have to offer with a particular focus on uh, the farm layout, as well as um, some of the potential infrastructure needs that uh, a leasing farmer might run into. Um, <clears throat> so as we talked about, acreage and soils are really some of the most important. Um, the mapping tools are a great place to start. But um, it's definitely important to, to do an on-site investigation as well. Uh, here in Connecticut, we are able through the FarmLink program to come out and help to assess your farm uh, for you know, potential enterprises that it could be suitable for, looking at soils and so forth. 
Um, and I can see there are a couple of people on the call who have actually had the opportunity to do that with, um, which is great. And um, so, yeah, we will come visit the farm with a consulting soil scientist, dig some holes, look around and kind of give you our, our honest take on the farm. Um, it's really wonderful to be able to do that with a potential um, tenant or farm seeker uh, alongside to kind of talk through what some of those needs are in real time. Uh, and if your FarmLink program in your state doesn't offer that, um, then I would also suggest reaching out to um, university extension services uh, or uh, potentially a, a private um, agricultural consultant who might be able to, to do some of the, the same type of work. So aside from um, acreage and soil, some of the things that we tend to look for are access and entry, how easy is it for the farmer to get in and out of the property um, with uh, perhaps the animals they're raising, the crops they're, they're harvesting, um, the crew that they're managing, um, what's the visibility like, is the farm going to do any sort of uh, direct retail, uh, either on the site or near the site, um, so you know, will it be possible for the, the public to kind of see what's going on. Uh, support services. This could be anything from uh, tractor dealership to um, uh, other farms in some cases, um, uh, local NRCS office, uh, and a university extension uh, service, and so forth. Uh, markets. This one um, could be a wide range, as it, we mentioned. Um, direct marketing with like a farm stand or CSA on site. It could also mean the proximity to a larger population center where someone might be eager to do a farmer's market or uh, service wholesale accounts. Neighboring farms is a is a big one. Um, I know when I'm in trouble on my farm, a piece of equipment breaks, or uh, I've got a question about a pest I've never seen before, I'm typically calling the, the farmers in my network first. And uh, some of those folks are, you know, 10, 15 minutes up the road. So they're kind of the, the first line of defense when it comes to those uh, issues that, that pop up on the farm. Uh, maybe you as the landowner can play a bit of that role if you have farming experience, or maybe you have connections with some of the other farmers in town. Uh, making introductions to those sorts of people if you have a, a tenant is probably one of the greatest gifts that you could uh, give those farmers as they um, get started in their um, their journey on your farm. Uh, and then opportunities for agritourism is another one that we, we think about. Some folks might not be comfortable with this on their farm, but it's certainly a, a growing um, sort of subsector of agriculture that is helping farmers to supplement their, um, their income from production and also uh, to sort of help um, bridge the gap between uh, farmers and, and the public that might not know what exactly goes into producing their crops. Next slide, please. All right, so um, as I said, we're gonna dive a little bit deeper into some of the infrastructure and considerations um, that are uh, the, the more physical attributes that are on site uh, for the farm. So I won't spend too much time on this slide. The one thing I do want to highlight is um, on the housing piece. Um, if there's not available housing on the farm, uh, one strategy a lot of folks look to is um, to think about accessory dwellings or um, sort of temporary dwellings on the farm for whoever is leasing the land. This could look like a tiny house, a yurt, a trailer, a camper, um, or maybe even creating a, a sort of separate apartment in the barn. Um, and this ties in directly to the legal considerations um, piece. All towns treat this very, very differently. Um, so I would highly recommend that you take some time, uh, look into your local planning and zoning regulations if you have them, uh, and just make sure that you're not gonna run afoul of um, any regulations in your town. Um, on the flip side, if you do come across some um, local policies that are unfriendly to um, having the flexibility for um, farm worker housing or, or farmer housing on your farm, uh, you might consider looking into getting those things changed. Um, 
this issue of housing is getting significantly worse across New England as a whole, and I'm cert certain in other regions of the country as well. Um, and with a lack of affordable rental housing or even um, affordable and adequate housing to purchase nearby, uh, I think having this flexibility is going to be a lot more important moving towards the future. Um, so this is also a role that you as the landowner can play to sort of advocate for the, the needs of um, farmers and agriculture as a whole in your area. Next slide, please. All right. I love tangible examples. So um, I threw in a few screenshots of the overhead map of my farm in Connecticut. Um, and I just wanted to highlight a few of these things that we're um, sort of talking about. So um, first and foremost, um, in our case, get my cursor onto the screen. Um, in our case, uh, we do have housing on, on the farm that we lease, which is huge for us. Um, we're a vegetable operation, and there are a few key times during the season where we really uh, benefit from being on site. Thanks, Rachel. I forgot that I was not the one sharing my screen, <laughs> um, which is, um, you know, may not be true for all farmers, but at, at least for our operation, it makes a, a big difference to um, be on site. Um, the second thing I want to highlight is you can see uh, Thomaston Road is also known as Route 109. Uh, so we're on a state highway, uh, which is both a um, challenge and an opportunity. We have tons and tons of cars uh, go by every day. So this could be a really great potential site in the future for on-farm retail. Uh, we have an existing CSA pickup that happens on the farm. Uh, on the flip side, we have people driving by at 55, 60 miles per hour, despite that being way above the speed limit. Um, so that can pose some challenges if you have, um, you know, livestock, pets, children, what have you. So definitely something to be aware of. Um, the other side of that is that uh, we have lots of people dropping in on the farm because they're curious about what we're doing, um, which can also be a blessing and a curse. Um, you'll also notice that there are some existing outbuildings. Um, we've got a little barn and shed complex and uh, what used to be a hoop house, which is now a greenhouse. Um, so thinking about, you know, what infrastructure you have, as well as what the access to that infrastructure is, is, is really important. Um, so you can see we have a nice driveway that kind of, kind of comes around to the the barnyard. Um, so if you were potentially living on site and not the farmer, um, that's a nice arrangement to have a little bit of separation from the sort of central hub of uh, the farm operations. Uh, but, you know, things to think about. Are the farm roads in adequate shape to um, access the barn and buildings at all times of year? Uh, or do they really wash out in the springtime when there's a lot of rain? Um, and likewise, you know, can you get someplace in the winter if there's, um, you know, animals being uh, housed in the winter and they need to be, you know, fed out hay or what have you. Utilities is another big one. Um, so you'll notice that, um, again, both the, the house and the barn are very close to the road. Uh, so we have plenty of uh, electrical service coming in um, to both of those locations. Um, and with water, um, we have probably inadequate water for our current needs, but we do have this brook that you can see running through the, the middle of um, the farm. Uh, again, you know, blessing and a curse. We have a water source and a water source if the, you know, well uh, is not adequate for our irrigation and, and housing needs. Um, but that means that we've got, you know, two brook crossings which need to be um, maintained in order to be able to utilize the um, sort of back fields there. Um, all right, I think that about does it for this slide. So we'll go on to the next. Um, again, you know, thinking about the soil maps, this is um, a slightly different view generated from um, Web Soil Survey. Um, the prime acreage is shown in, in green. 
and the uh, farmland of statewide importance shown in blue. Um, one of the big considerations for us was um, having room to expand our operation. So while we're currently growing on about four acres, we have probably about 15 acres in total that could be tillable, um, and some of the other acreage uh, could be you know, useful for uh, making hay, grazing uh, cattle, et cetera. Next slide, please. Um, zooming out even a little bit more, another thing that was attractive about this location for us was our proximity to um, other farms and farm fields. Um, so again, if we kind of grow beyond um, the needs of our property that we're leasing, um, there are other fields close by that could potentially um, add to our acreage base in years to come. Um, you'll also notice, you know, again, sort of similar uh, industries right close to us. We've got a big nursery down the street. Uh, we've got another farm up on the corner with agritourism events and such. Um, so really nice to be part of a, a rural uh, but active ag community. Next slide, please. All right. Zooming out even a little bit more, um, thinking about markets. So um, there we are up in red in the, in the left corner. Um, and though we're in a rural community, um, we're really close to larger population centers. So one of the primary places we market our produce is at a farmer's market in Bridgeport towards the bottom left of the screen. Um, within about 45 minutes, we can reach um, four or five different cities with quite large uh, populations. Uh, and again, our access to highways is really good. So as Sue mentioned, if you were, um, you know, looking for a dairy contract, um, you know, wouldn't be too far off the off the beaten path for the milk truck to come. Uh, and for our purposes, not not too difficult for us to, um, you know, get to both our markets and, um, you know, potential uh, vendors for, you know, farm equipment and such from our farm. Next slide, please. Oh, the last thing I'll say on that last slide is that um, we are within about 20 minutes of um, a couple of larger population centers, which may, uh, doesn't always work out, but may provide um, a better sort of housing stock for employees to find affordable uh, rental housing or, or housing to purchase. Next slide, please. All right, back getting into the, zo uh, the zoomed in view. Um, so the barn we have is an old dairy barn, and um, old dairy barns are not particularly useful for a lot of modern uh, farm operations. Even for dairies, the um, configurations of the stalls, um, the arrangement of, you know, sort of the milking parlors and such is pretty different from how folks design things now. Um, so we're kind of working to retrofit things to our needs. Um, and as the landowners, you know, you might look at this beautiful barn and think of the historic value it has and so forth, but it might be important for you to think about, um, you know, some changes that the farmer would be eager to make in order to make it work for their purposes. So if you could go into the next slide, I've got an example to kind of help envision that. Um, the main thing that we want to think about is the flow of products and people on, on your farm. So um, we were talking before about access via driveways and so forth. Um, you know, things like parking areas, uh, bathrooms, crew break rooms, and also where um, different products and, and things will be uh, stored or processed um, is really important. So this is just, you know, an example from University of Vermont Extension that kind of helps to um, it's one way to help envision the flow of, in this case, products, but you might consider doing this um, with a potential uh, farmer to think about everything from, you know, farm crew to customers to products and so forth to make sure that there aren't any pinch points that could either um, negatively impact you as the landowner or the farmer. Next slide, please. So, um, I love the Univers University of Vermont Extension. Uh, I think they provide some of the best um, resources for um, farmers in the region and honestly, uh, things that people across the country can use. 
And uh, one place they do that really well is on infrastructure. So this is a case study that can be found on their website um, from Indian Line Farm in, uh, I believe in Williamstown, Massachusetts. Uh, again, one of these old dairy barns that I mentioned. Um, and you can see from this picture, you know, it's been retrofitted. They've got solar panels uh, and it kind of suggests just from the outside, they might be using it for um, some new innovative types of uses. Next slide, please. Um, so this room that uh, the farmer and one of the extension agents there is standing in um, used to be about two feet shorter than it was. This is really similar to the barn that's on our property. Um, so two feet shorter than that, the, the farmer who's in the front, her head's basically brushing the ceiling. And I don't think she's too, too much above five feet. Um, and I imagine a lot of you might have similar sort of structures on the barn, uh, in, in your barns or on your farms. Um, so she undertook a really um, amazing project with some grant funds from the state of Massachusetts to actually raise the uh, the ceiling in that lower level of the barn to revamp their wash and pack area and their uh, CSA distribution site, which you see here. Next slide, please. On the other side of that wall from the uh, picture we just saw is their wash and pack, which they've retrofitted to be nice and bright, plenty of uh, electricity and water with concrete floors to be able to move things around and floor drains to be able to manage the water properly. Next slide. And then here you see that overhead view. So, um, you know, on the uh, east side of the barn, the CSA room, um, in the middle of the wash pack where produce comes in dirty from the fields, is washed and stored, and then, um, you know, moves into the CSA room or off to market. Next slide, please. Oh, we can go back to the last one. <laughs> so, these plans are um, really in depth and not meant to scare you as landowners thinking about leasing your farm. You know, it's not likely many of you are going to do a total renovation on your um, barn to meet the needs of the farmer, um, at least not right away. But um, more to illustrate that um, farms are really complex businesses and the types of infrastructure they need often is. Um, an investment that's uh, recouped over many years. So to think about um, setting someone up for success, you want to be thinking about a, a lease term that makes some of these improvements and efficiencies possible. Um, so in, in most cases, offering the longest lease that you're comfortable with and that the farmer is looking for um, can really help to contribute to the success of these projects over time. Um, the other thing about a longer lease term is that it really opens doors for um, some of the grant funding that's out there, either from um, state governments, the United States Department of Agriculture, and others uh, to, to make farms uh, more viable and um, cleaner, safer, better places to, to work and, and produce food for the community. Um, and so if you're interested in learning more about um, sort of farm configurations. Um, as I mentioned, University of Vermont has a lot of resources. Um, other extension agents in other states can also provide um, typically a lot of free uh, consultation on these sorts of matters. Uh, and I would be more than happy to connect you with uh, resources in your state if you need assistance. And with that, I think we're going to go into questions and answers. Yes. Um, so thank you so much to all of our presenters. We have plenty of time for questions and answers. And, and before I stop sharing my screen, um, just in the chat, I'm putting a link to an evaluation form. So if before you leave the webinar today, if you would be willing to fill that out, we would greatly appreciate it. Um, after we let you go, um, you'll have about a week until our next webinar. Um, round two is next Wednesday at the same time, uh, should be same Zoom channel. And then in terms of asking questions um, to any of our presenters right now, you can either put them in the chat and I'll be glad to moderate those or you can use um, the function at the bottom of the Zoom screen to raise your hand um, and you can ask the question yourself. Uh, so with that, I'll, I'll open the floor for questions.
Yes. Rachel, I think you're muted if you're. Thanks. Yes, we will have uh, copies of the slides. Um, they'll be online and available to you. And then we'll also send them out with the recordings. Thank you for asking. I uh, was wondering if I could find out how to reach Jay Silverman. I have some property in Massachusetts and I thought he might be helpful uh, for me to talk to him. Sure, good. gladly. Um, yep, yeah, I'll put my email in the chat. Um, and so I'm happy to happy to talk with you and um, uh, yeah, set, set up time to to talk about what, what you have available and what your thoughts might be. Thank you. Uh, I see that Marion has their hand up. Hi, thanks. Um, I guess I'm I've been interested in the idea of like incubator farms that are, you know, maybe shared with several plots, I guess. Um, this is much more focused on kind of on like an individual farmer model, but I wonder if you'll have any thoughts or um, advice about that. I can jump in real quick and then if the other presenters have thoughts, we can hear from them as well. Um, we are going to be talking a little bit about uh, group land tenure next week, which um, is sort of a includes incubator farmers, but also in includes other ways of multiple people. Uh, using the same piece of land. Um, incubator farms are a challenging model um, because typically you're offering um, both some sort of farmer education component uh, as well as the, the land opportunity. Um, in some cases, this happens in sort of uh, an informal way as well. I got my start um, on my with my own farm operation, uh, subleasing a portion of another farmer's uh, field, so that farmer was on site, able to, um, you know, again answer questions I had, help me solve problems, uh, and so forth. Um, but again, we'll get into the, some of this group land tenure stuff next week. Uh, what I like about multiple people operating on the same piece of land is that there's a lot of opportunities for um, shared infrastructure, shared cost of materials, uh, shared responsibility in terms of maintenance. Um, but with that also comes, um, I think, a more, um, uh, a more urgent need to have roles and responsibilities defined across those uh, different people farming on the same piece of land. So the agreements tend to be a little bit more complicated than uh, if it was a single farmer. Uh, so I think it's it's a great thing to be thinking about, uh, but with that comes a little bit more complication. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks, Thanks Mary. Um, one of the questions in the chat says, could, could you elaborate on the differences between residential leases for farm and housing versus commercial leases for a farm operation. Sure, I'm, I'm happy to touch on that, but then anybody else who wants to weigh in, feel free. Um, yeah, so, you know, both of these leases tend to have pretty different considerations in them. They'll have some of the, the basics, and we'll talk a little bit more about lease basics next week, but, you know, they'll, they'll have things spe specifying the term and how much rent's being paid and what can and can't be done. Um, oftentimes, they've got quite different terms to them. Residential leases tend to be where you either see things like month to month or, or more commonly yearly, whereas farm leases tend to usually be either yearly or much longer than that. So what, one thing we tend to do is recommend that folks have two separate leases for residential, a residential lease and a farming lease if, if somebody's leasing both on your property. And there's a couple of reasons to do that. Um, one is again, that the different terms that I mentioned, both in terms of length and what's being covered. Um, and also trying to make sure that something happening with the farm doesn't immediately cause housing insecurity for the farmer. Um, if if something were to change, there's been been situations where that's happened, and even through best intentions, something's changed with the farm lease, and suddenly, without warning, the farmer is without housing, which is a situation that we never want to see people in. Um, so there's ways to cleverly make those so they reference each other, and and um, you know give a certain countdown that if one lease ends, maybe the other one will end, depending on the circumstances. Um, but but definitely helpful to have them separate and to make sure that uh, you know considerations for each one are are covered within them. The only thing I would add as well is that um, in most states, there are 
many more uh, and much more stringent rules about um, how a housing lease can be set up uh, as opposed to the agricultural lease. Um, so we always recommend that people run their leases through an attorney to make sure that um, they're not running afoul of any um, any state law. Um, but with housing involved, uh, those things are a bit more a bit more serious, and it it does change how you can deal with things like um, you know defaults in the lease and and, and so forth. I think Joey Diana Gates might have a question. Yes, thank you. I the more the dots it's only to save the chat for some reason um anyways um so i have land um it's been in our family for over a century and my uncle is currently farming it with gmo corn and soy and i'd like to transition it over to biodynamic organic farming and i'm wondering if you have thoughts about you know constructing leases um, that allow for that change and the certification time it takes to take land out of one type of production and trans transition it to another. Um, some of that depends on what the new operation will be producing. Um, as Jay said, I think, you know, taking a really close look at where the soil nutrient levels are and things like that will, will play a big role. Um, if the farmer is going, if the new farmer is going to seek any sort of um, organic certification or anything along those lines, there's typically a um, three-year transition period, um, but you can get what's called a um, transitional certification for the interim, but they won't have full organic certification for, for three years. Um, any other thoughts from the other presenters on this? Yeah, one, one thing I'll add is I, I think that's a great example of when a tenant is is changing use of a property and whether that's rehabilitating it in some way, um, bringing somebody back into production. Sometimes it's it's getting weeds under control or uh, bringing hayland back into active production from something that's overgrown or or things where the, the farmer's basically investing time and effort and and often materials to make something like that happen. And so there's just a few different ways to look at that as a landowner. Um, sometimes a landowner will have a certain amount of reduced rent or even free rent in the very beginning to sort of, you know, monetarily incentivize those those changes on behalf of the farming tenant. Um, and sometimes in combination with that, it's a matter of how long the lease is to make sure that the, the tenant feels like all that work they're putting in it, that they know they'll be there long enough to, to see those benefits happen. Um, so I've seen that happen with things like organic certification as well, or, or just organic practices. Um, and it's certainly possible to, to say in the lease, you know, to require certain practices like that. And I think being upfront and having that in the lease and and having both parties understand what those requirements are is really important rather than, you know, springing it on somebody later or having them loosely defined. Um, so that, that's all definitely doable. It just depends what sort of what sort of farmer is interested in that area. We'll take questions about anything. If you're considering making your land available there, even if it's a, a ragged or not fully formed question, um, we're happy to help you try to think through it. Um, someone asked, could you discuss challenges of a tenant versus the owner qualifying for government funding or grants? Yeah, with regarding leases, we'll mention that having a longer term lease to be able as a farmer qualify for funding, whether it's a grant or whether it's outside financing. Um, let's just say for example, USDA requires at least a three year lease that you have to submit with the financing application. Um, so there are some challenges as a tenant to be able to make improvements to lease land um, as the land owner seeking outside financing. Uh, probably depends if you're an active farmer to be able to access farm lenders, um, but mostly we would see that the tenant farmer would be making these efforts to seek outside fin um, financing. Um, 
And so there might just be a little bit of flexibility on, on your end needed to have a longer term lease. Um, this not, if it is like a loan, um, there are ways to like not have you assume the same risk in the loan that this can be totally separate and on the tenant. Yeah, I, I totally second that. And, and one sort of interesting um, example that deviates from that that I think is just important for people to know about is when pursuing NRCS grants or the, the National Resource Conservation Service as part of the USDA. Um, and it's just really important to make sure you understand with those grants, but both you and the farmer together, um, who has ultimate responsibility for the project in the vast majority of, of NRCS grants, um, at least the ones that I'm aware of. It, the, the improvement or the project is tied to the land and really ultimately the landowner's responsibility in a lot of ways for the life of the project. So there's a, a lifespan with that project. Say if it's a, I don't know, I'm, I'm making this up, but if it's a greenhouse that has a, a five or 10 year lifespan, um, part, of the, part of that agreement is to have that infrastructure be on that land for that certain amount of time. Um, and so, you know, with the right agreement, the, land, the farmer can be the one using it and can even help do some of the application. And um, But there's been times where a farmer and then a tenant farmer and a landowner have gone through an NRCS grant process and the farmer has done the legwork and thinks they can take that improvement with them uh, if they relocate. And that can actually get into, a, into an issue because for whatever that project length is, it's tied to the property. Um, so it, <laughs> kind of a specific example, but if you're thinking about NRCS grants in particular, just make sure you understand the ins and outs of that. Um, and uh, you know, for any of these grants, they'll, they should be pretty clear about who owns the improvement and, and things like that. And in some cases, too, uh, particularly with federal grants from the USDA, there is a, an adjusted gross income cap, which in some cases the landowner might exceed. Uh, they're typically pretty high. They're typically around like $900,000 or so uh, a year. So uh, not super common, but every now and then you get a really high net worth landowner or potentially a company that owns a piece of land that would disqualify them from qualifying for those grants. So in those cases, um, again, having a, a significant enough lease term and having the farmer apply for them would be the, the best course of action. Go ahead, George. Yes, I, I had a question. Um, I'm not sure that this is any different than all the suggestions you've made, but if you have a family, <clears throat> well, as uh, Joey Diana does, um, that where, where there are different members that have a stake in a particular property, um, getting them on board um, or finding some, some way forward uh, for making a land available either through lease or, um, well, I guess through lease prim most primarily, um, are, are there are there different considerations or should I just really be working with the same set of considerations that you've presented? Uh, yeah, because first, first you got to get everyone on the same page. Yeah, I think I guess to start having some of those big picture conversations, looking at that list of criteria that um, I believe it was Nikki shared on some of those earlier slides, as well as some uh, some resources like we we have this elements of a good farm lease guide. Ways to not necessarily dive into the nitty gritty of constructing a lease yet, but to just look at some of the major items and and have everybody sort of you know in agreement on the way forward um, can save a lot of time and headaches later because dragging a farmer into it and then getting different answers from different family members or even having lack of clarity about who they can get permissions from can be really difficult. Um, and one slight offshoot offshoot on that too is looking toward the future if the property might be changing hands for um, you know, a successor of the landowner and seeing whether there's often um, often or sometimes stipulations you can put in the lease to make sure the lease continues, even if it changes hands. Um, and if that's the case, making sure the next generation's on board, even, even generally, um, rather than having this really jarring change of, of uh, standards and practices if uh, for the farmer, if the land were to change hands. So trying to have a lot of those conversations and and have people in the loop on that can be really important. Um, but but trying to keep that as general as possible and not going too far down the rabbit hole just yet. Thanks. <clears throat> what keeps you up at night? 
when you're lying around thinking about whether or not to try to make your land available, what 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 do you chew on or have any of you found yourself in a situation where you think you might want to do it, but your partner, or other members of your family aren't sure, or what are your big like, this is my biggest worry about a farmer. Um, any questions like that? Well, I, I think um, oftentimes uh, families have uh, notions about a land and it has to do with uh, memory and legacy and, um, and, and so not necessarily about soil quality. Um, and it, it, it has more to do with just, it's a pretty property. Um, and so um, moving from that to a working farm relationship is, is quite a distance, um, uh, is, especially if um, there isn't necessarily a, a financial insistence that something has to change. Uh, but having land fallow in this time um, seems so unnecessary. Um, so, uh, those are some of the things that keep me up at night. It's just that uh, that that these conversations can be um, can bring up a lot of unanticipated family dynamics, and and navigating those objectively, if that's possible, um, is 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 a big one. Is is a big one. So some of these methodologies that you're talking about and uh, resources um just give more arrows in the quiver if if there is a family member that that wants to bring over or it's i don't even want to use wants to bring over wants to um encourage others to consider something that they haven't necessarily before without a, without a lot of conflict when when you panelists are entering into a situation where there are some sticky family dynamics, um, what kinds of things do you usually recommend to those families or where do you send them for guidance to help them really get a good start on the conversation? Well, we always start with, I say we, and I, maybe I shouldn't speak for Jay too, but at Land for Good, I think we tend to start with the sort of values, visions, and goals. And so if there's things that you can all agree on, that tends to be the place where there's um, the most room for, you know, forward progress. Um, so if it is something like the, you know, the beauty of the property or, um, you know, memories of the property and how it was used in the past, um, perhaps you can use those shared experiences and, and values to um, work towards agreement on the vision for the future. Um, and to get that to a more concrete place, I think um, if you're outside of the farming community, um, you know we've we've listed a number of resources um, here today that you know you're not likely to know about unless you're um, a farmer or or working with farmers on a daily basis. Uh, so making sure that people have as much information and and tools available to them to understand. Um, sort of the current state of agriculture and, and what's available is um, another helpful strategy. And Nikki, I saw you unmuted. Did you have something you want to add? Uh, yeah, I guess with kind of these resources and organizations and services that are for farming families or farming families looking to transfer, whatever that may be, you know, Will had commented that there are these resources for you to utilize. But also like as us service providers, we are also able to talk to you and your family as non-farming landowners with the goals to work and offer your land to farmers. Um, so I just, yeah, I, I don't want it to like reword what Will said, but just in offering in addition that, you know, you could have somebody come out and facilitate a conversation with your family members um, as well as any farmer can. Um, Thanks. Um, a couple other questions did pop up. Um, one person wanted to know 
would any farmer ever be interested in a small piece of land, like something that's like three acres? And someone also said they had a concern about um, what if the farmer doesn't keep the land tidy? Like what if they leave a mess or how do you, so how do you deal with um, those kinds of things? I'll gladly jump on the acreage piece because actually that, that was a piece I wanted to, to elevate too. And so thank you for asking that. Um, yeah, I mean, one of the things we try to really focus on is not trying to conflate or not trying to overly define what is a farm versus how much farmland is enough farmland. Um, because people are getting really creative on how to access farmland or how to run their businesses. Um, definitely depends what region you're in, but especially in the Northeast, um, I'm working with a lot of farm seekers that are looking for a quarter of an acre or half an acre um, if they're doing really intensive vegetables or working with folks that um, employ what I like to call this home base strategy, where maybe they own their, they own their house and they own a key amount of infrastructure or something to have direct control over those assets, but they don't own nearly enough farmland for what they're hoping to do. And so they piece together a patchwork of leased acreage, um, which is that's what I do with, with my own hay farming. So you never know with a three acre field like that. Um, it either could be plenty for someone who's trying to do something really small scale and intensive just on your property, or it could be this perfect additional field for someone else that's already farming in the area and might be looking to pick it up to, to you know, do something with it, again, depending what it's well suited for. Um, so we definitely don't want to take away from this to discourage folks that, you know, if you're not sitting on a, a full quote unquote farm, if you're lacking infrastructure, if you feel like your property is too small, um, it's important to recognize what the limitations might be and what sort of farmer might be interested in it. But we're definitely not trying to discourage anybody from, um, you know, making it known, making it out there and seeing who might be interested. It just, it all depends. Um, and the one last thing I'll say is I, I think with smaller acreage, what, what we tend to see are maybe newer or more inexperienced farmers that are interested in it, starting on a much smaller scale. Um, hopefully they've done some business planning or even business training courses or worked for other farms and have some experience. But sometimes it's the the beginning farmers that are looking to access that much smaller acreage to, to get their business started and try it out. So that has a whole separate set of, um, you know, how much kind of forgiveness do you have for that learning curve um, and, and that sort of thing. I guess quick with the, the junkie uh, items piling up, um, that probably just goes back to expectations, right? And you have to, I think, first and foremost, ask yourself, how you define junky items and, and is that plastics and some other necessary pieces of farm life that that particular farmer has chosen to use as materials or just versus what now becomes a liability and is a safety hazard. Um, so it's kind of the difference of like your aesthetic expectation for the farmer's needs. Um, and of course, leases in maybe even a frustrating way could be so flexible you could put in and agree on any terms you wish and if that's something that you know is you're anticipating that may be potentially happening or you just don't want even that to you know happen at all you can put that in a lease and talk through it and I would say um you know be specific in that language um but again kind of your expectations versus the farmer's needs and put it in a lease such as like trash removal and kind of iron out those issues. And I guess I, one other thought I have is if the person who's um, you're considering making some land available, if they have previous experience elsewhere, um, you can always ask, do you have pictures of your previous operation? Um, you can talk to previous landowners or if, if that person was a manager at a farm, you can talk to the person who employed them. Um, so if you're working with somebody or considering somebody who has prior experience, you know, you also can do your due diligence um, to and and they should also be doing that um, to try to learn more about you and what kinds of relationships you've had with with folks in the community, too. Um, so hopefully, uh, just to reemphasize Nikki's point, um, everyone's doing a great job at being open and clear and honest with your communication and then really depending on a written lease as a tool to make sure that everyone is clear and, and understands um, what the agreement is. <clears throat> um, Jay, did you wanna add something? Oh, I, I well, wanted to say that thanks for Nikki for picking up on that. I didn't mean to not answer the second question there. Um, and there's a, the one tiny piece I wanted to add for that too is, is um, this dives into the weeds a little bit on, on lease crafting, but it's really common to have considerations for the end of the lease and making sure you stipulate what kind of shape the tenant would leave the land in. Um, 
whenever the lease ends too. So it's kind of the, the two-part piece, um, looking at what state they keep it in while the lease is going on, and then very clear expectations of what happens when the lease ends. Right, right. And we and we hope that you'll all, oh, I'm sorry, Sue, go ahead. I saw you unmuted. That's okay. I was just going to add a little note that I like to talk to my landowners about and let them know they're driving the bus. They're the one that they're in control of their land and what's happening on their land. So don't be afraid to talk over those things. Um, and in Maine, we have a Maine agricultural mediation program. And so that's a place where uh, people can go if they don't want to get into the real hard uh, negotiations with legal counsel. They can use these references for mediating back and forth. So just a couple of things to plug. Mm -hmm. um, and we, we hope you'll join us next week at the same time and using the same um, Zoom link, we'll be getting into some more details of some of these methods uh, that you and a um, farmer might enter into. And, and we'll also have another guest speaker. Um, and also if you have not yet had the chance to fill out uh, the evaluation, please do make sure um, that you do that. So thanks so much and um, reach out anytime if you have further questions.